Hi, and welcome to Simcha, a celebration of life. I'm your host, Aaron Halevi. Miriam Kosman's recently published book, Circle, Arrow, Spiral, explores some of the complex gender issues in Judaism and delves into the midrashic interpretations of women's struggle for equality. The author, lecturer, and guest speaker at Sinai and Daba 2015 discusses how these issues play a cosmic role in awakening humanity. I think that a lot of people, when they think about the woman's role in Judaism, it creates a lot of uh, antagonism because the feeling is that the man is always in the public role, he's always out there doing things, he's, uh, he's the one that learns the Torah, he's the one that uh, is part of the minion, and very often women feel that they don't have a place in Judaism. The place that we're heading towards is a female place. It's a place of being, it's a place of love, it's a place of relationship, it's a place where we will experience the the relationship that we built during our life here in this world in the experience of our relationship that we built through our life here. First of all, my work is based on more of a Kabbalistic approach to the whole thing. And um, what I want to maintain is that there's always two voices in Judaism. There's always the female voice and the male voice. And the ultimate goal in Judaism is to create a synthesis between these two voices. I describe the female force as the circle, the male force as the arrow, and the synthesis as the balance between the two forces. And I think a lot of people are sort of confused. How do I be a woman? How do I be a successful woman? I want to be successful, I also want to be a woman. And, you know, the feminine aspects of men. It's also a very, very important point. Like, how, how does uh, a man express his female side? We don't, we don't talk about that a lot. You know, we don't hear a discussion about it. So my book is sort of to try and explore this concept of gender from a much, much deeper perspective. Um, I, what I discovered when I started researching it is that this is way, way, way beyond what, uh, you know, what a particular couple is going to decide about how, who's going to, you know, wash the dishes and who's going to, you know, take care of the kids. It's really, it's like the entire universe is based on this foundation of understanding the, the dynamic between the male and female force. And like I said, the, the goal is a synthesis. The strongest metaphor for our relationship with God. And the strongest metaphor for what's going on in the universe is the interaction between the male and the female force. And um, the basis for the metaphor is the physical interaction between the man and the woman, because men and women are exactly the same in everything except for what they're not the same in. And in those areas, when there's a meeting between a male and female force, that's where we can discover what it really means to be male, what it means to be female. You find that actually in Kabbalistic literature that after something has been described as a female trait or a male trait, it's used to describe a man or a woman. It doesn't necessarily... So I don't look at it as something that, um, that, you know, that you are. You're born a woman, therefore you are like this. You're born a man, therefore you are like that. What we're really talking about is a way of being. It's not what you do, it's how you do it. There's many, many different facets to it. The feminine force has many different facets. One of it is um, a fluidity and an openness, um, of being, of being willing to be open to other ideas and other ways of looking at things, which I think is the basis of what I did, because um, I, never, I didn't like the way the man and women's role in Judaism was being portrayed. So I really, I delved into the, into the, into the sources and I learned from a lot of different people. And this, this model was sort of, built from the bottom up and, and I think that a lot of uh, a lot of circle kind of traits can change the way you live your life and just by the way I think it's very important to know that men or you know somebody who feels that they have to strengthen their arrow part there's a lot there's an art to that as well you know like it, the, the arrow force can be a very very destructive force Okay, so the arrow force is a progress-oriented force, okay? It's the, the I, call, I call the arrow force the excellence force, right? And you're striving to be better at whatever you can do, to accomplish more, to acquire more, to be more. And you know, the arrow is a perfect symbol of going upwards. The Garden of Eden is like the symbol of the feminine force, and that's where we started from, and that's where we're going. And that is a picture of the ideal. The ideal world is circle. We believe that the world to come is also a feminine force. That's the ideal. Then we were, so, so, so in, in the Garden of Eden, there was tremendous unity between man and woman, and there was an equality. 
Then we moved into the into the into the real world. This was after the sin and the curse that God gave woman. There's a whole number of curses that man received, that woman received, that the snake received. But the woman got the curse that she received was to men will be to man will be your desire, but he will rule over you. So a lot of religion, religious people take that as a, oh, this is the way it's supposed to be, that he's supposed to rule over you. But on a deeper level, it's, and it's very, very clear, you don't even need a deeper level, just reading the context inside is that a curse is not a good thing. It's a bad thing. In other words, a curse is not the way we want to live. And what God was doing before they walked out of the Garden of Eden, which was this world of unity and of real, authentic self, he said, I'm sending you out into the world and I want to describe to you what it's going to be like. In that world you're going to, your desire will be to man, meaning you will constantly be trying to pull him back into the circle, but he will rule over you. In other words, you're going to be in a male world. And throughout history, there's been a um, there's been a tension between these forces, and generally speaking, the arrow had a much louder force. When the feminist movement began, whatever it was, 170 years ago, this dynamic started to change. And now you see that there's a much greater pull in the direction of the female voice. Um, not just that women are having have have more power as uh, not just because they're doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs, but because the way of the female way of doing is becoming much more uh, democracy. For example, is a more feminine way of doing things. Right, the idea of, of, of ruling by consensus instead of by hierarchy. Right, the openness. So now we're on a sort of, you know, we're, we're moving very very much in the feminine direction. The reality is that there's a struggle the whole time between this male and female voice. My personal feeling is we're moving too much in the direction of the female voice. We need to go back to the voice of discipline, the voice of focus, the voice of taking responsibility, the voice of commitment. Those are all on that side, right? And then eventually the goal is to reach back to that Garden of Eden, which is a circle, which is a circle kind of mode. Welcome back. Israeli-born Rami Meiri is an urban mural artist whose creative work has changed the landscape of many cities around the world. His unique style blurs the boundaries between reality and illusion, creating a dialogue and interconnection between people and places. As a guest of the Israeli Embassy, Rami recently held an interactive workshop at the Zolilia Malindi Community Center in Mfoleni, Cape Town. Before 35 years, I uh, start my first war uh, with the permission from the city on uh, Gordon Beach in Tel Aviv. And I see that how much the people love it, and I continue to make more murals in uh, Tel Aviv. Then I figure out that I can make it around the world, my mural, and create in more and more city all over the world. in a place where you have a lot of pressure on the people and will have sometimes bad news every day. The people need happiness and need somebody who can give it to them. So that's uh, go up in Tel Aviv, in my country, and then I figure out it's not enough for me. I want to make it for the rest of the world. When you put something out, you have to get in. Uh, and when I'm traveling here in a wonderful country and I say the, the wonderful view and the wonderful people, it's something who get in my heart and then it's gonna go out here or in the next uh, place where I'm gonna visit. I wanna be happy in my life and I wanna make other people happy. One, two, three, go! When I meet these uh, people and I get the happiness from them, they make me happy and I can share this happiness with them. We're gonna take this energy now and we're gonna make, we're gonna paint a mural on this wall. We're gonna put the picture on the wall. I think that everybody have a passion for painting and everybody want to expose himself on a wall. So I understand that this is something very important to give the people to expose themselves and give them the tools to, uh, to make it in the right way. Everybody will feel his color, his color that is filled, okay? You just have to find the right way how to take the energy, to be free and take the, your energy, put it on a wall and expose it from the wall.
The idea was for Israel to bring Rami to South Africa, to use Jewish values of tikkun olam, of helping to improve the world, to repair the world, and values that the state of Israel holds dear to itself. And so we brought Rami to South Africa, and the way he's been to many other countries around the world, to help in areas which could do with regeneration and working with the community. And this is one of those projects that Rami's done. I want that you, everybody will make it. Okay, so in each uh, culture and in each, uh, every kind of people, we all need the happiness in our life and we all need to create art in our life. You can put somebody more here, if uh, there is, on this day, lady, with the blue. Yeah, okay. Sometimes I go for places that they didn't have the way to make it. Nobody teach them how to make it. So I, I can go and give them to make it. And I know when I left this place, those people who paint, few of them gonna continue paint murals and uh, make this in, in this uh, area. What we look for is we look for a community that is in a place that wants to help regenerate, that wants to help work, that would like to do something artistic and something different. So we found a community in Pretoria, we found a building in Pretoria, and we found a community in the Cape area. And we contacted them and spoke to them about what the areas do and the messages, trying to build together a better community for themselves. In Pretoria, we create a very, very uh, huge uh, mural. It's six floor high. And we take the shape of the building and we use it for our uh, uh, plan. And it was a uh, one building with a lot of uh, uh, white floor. And I put on this floor two figures who calibrate and work together, one black person and one white person. And these uh, two figures influence all the people who walk in the city. It is very classy, excellent, well painted and magnificent. The street, it looks so beautiful. Something unique, it's different. Usually I take the environment as a part of my work. I create my murals as a part of the environment. I take the shape of the building, I take the architecture and I continue. Sometimes you don't find what is real and what is the illusion, and you don't find the border between them. This is my, the, the idea of my work. I don't take only the wall and uh, make my work as a science on a wall. You can see that this is a, a, a real bench, but it's continued to the wall. It's half bench real and half bench unreal. And people can sit near the painted lady of the bench and they take a photograph with her. When you walk in the street and you see something that you're not sure that it's real or not real, that, that, this is the magic. And then you feel that something wrong in this, and when you look, it excites you to find that it's a, a, a painting and not something real. You see, I, I, this is the wall, how it was before and then after. But I continue the environment. I took the uh, port lift, I took the sea behind, and I give another atmosphere for this uh, port. This means that I have to think and plan my work exactly how it's gonna be, uh, change the environment with only with ideas. And then I can make it by myself and create it. For us, the importance of bringing Rami out from Israel to South Africa was to emphasize the tikkun olam, to emphasize the, create, the Jewish value of building a better world, of helping those people who are in a position where you can work with them and you can, and you can move to make a community a better place. So here, Rami is saying, look at the value of working together. Look at the Jewish value of being together, of helping one another. And he's created it in the mural. He's created it in the workshop that he's done. And all of those, me those Jewish messages and those messages from the State of Israel are all tied together. I haven't felt that spirit of people doing something willingly together as a group. I haven't felt that in a long time. So I could experience it today and it, it, it affected me even if I was in a distance. It brings life to the room and if it brings life to the room, it will bring uh, that energy and, and that excitement and that enthusiasm to the children as well. We've come together today because in Jewish values, we believe in tikkun olam. And what is tikkun olam? 
Tikkun Olam is what we do to repair the world. Um, we, we want to make the world a better place. Today I actually found out that, uh, that painting can be used in a more therapeutic way because I've seen how the kids are relating to uh, the paintbrush. They have become more like one piece with the paintbrush and the paint and the wall. So I could see the effectiveness of the, of the whole exercise that they started with. And it was very much awesome and it was exciting for the kids you could see. <laughs> yes. One, two, three, go. Mufuleni is a school which was put together by Africa Tikkun and Mufuleni actually provides them with a place to actually come together under supervision and we're happy to be able to provide a day's entertainment for them. We decided that we wanted to work with Africa Tikkun as a natural partner, Africa Tikkun, who also embody the Jewish values, and not only embody the Jewish values, incorporate it into their name. Tikkun meaning to repair, Tikkun meaning to make the world a better place, tying it to Africa, tying it to Jewish values, tying it to Israel, and for us it was a natural partnership that we wanted to work with. He's transformed this wall um, in the art room, and this picture's been done by the pupils themselves, by the children themselves, and it'll be a a reminder to them moving forward always of bringing different communities together um, to build peace and harmony. When you grow up in the community, such as in Fuleni, in the township community, uh, not everything that you do or not every impact that you have on, on other people's lives will mean something to them. For them to have a painting like this in, in, in the wall that will stay there and remind them for years and years to come and for other kids to actually enjoy that are coming uh, uh, behind them. So kids are feeling more special now that they have contributed something. Now they, they're more part of the, 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 the Africa Tikkun as a whole because they have something that they will go home today and be proud of. So that is amazing. I'm a very happy person. And I, I thank God that he make me something like that and I can give other people this happiness. Thank you very much. According to the Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Creation, every month of the Jewish year has a corresponding letter of the Hebrew alphabet, a sign of the zodiac, and one of the twelve tribes of Israel. With that in mind, Sarah Evian takes a look at the sixth month of the Hebrew calendar, Elul. We learn in Kabbalah that the world is created with the Hebrew letters and each month is created through a Hebrew letter. A Hebrew letter, a tribe, a breast, a stone, a, a, a precious stone that was on the breastplate of the Kohan Gadol and also um, one of the, the, the permutations of God's name. And the letter for Elul is a Yud. Now the Yud is the smallest point of the Hebrew alphabet. It's really a dot. And it is from the Yud that everything else becomes. And Elul is about going into that point of essential connection with self, with the universe and with God. So every month, if we are sensitive, we can glean from that month, the energy through which that month is created and through which healing comes. We live in a very, very physical, material world, and we're always searching for the things that are outside of us and what we are wanting to achieve. And a lot of that is very external, and it doesn't feed us. We're all filled, in a sense, with an emptiness. And how we can fill that emptiness is by going deeply inside and finding our authentic self. And we do this through the process called teshuvah. 
And the whole month of Elul is about searching and returning. It is about returning to our essential self, and it is about remembering what it is that we've done throughout the year that doesn't feel good for us. And also about what does feel good for myself. Where have I expressed myself fully and where have I been, my authentic self, aligned with the goodness of the world and, and expressed my uniqueness in making the world a better place? So Teshuvah is very much about returning to that place and in a sense, fixing it. The Aramaic word for Elul really means a search. And what the month is, is that we are searching in ourselves to find the places and the spaces and the people that we have become and to see what it is that we, we don't like anymore, what it is that's external. It is not a month of beating ourselves up for what we've done wrong. It is a month of searching with love and compassion at who we would like to become. The shofar in Elul is really about hearing my own unique soul voice. It's a time of really going internally to my, my, my pure point of my womb, my, my beautiful open space of, of purity. The month of Elul is really Virgo. That's what the month is. It's a feminine month. And virgins have a sense of purity, of innocence, and of a capacity to receive. A virgin has, a, has a, an empty womb, in a sense. And that is who we try to become in the month of Elul. We try and make ourselves vessels to receive. We shed the externality making ourselves as pure as possible so that we can receive this amazing energy that's going to come in the next month, which is Tishrei, Rosh Hashanah. So for this month, I bless us all that we're able to clean out our containers, making ourselves open and awake and aware for what is to become, and that we are able to have real compassion for ourselves and to hear our own unique soul voice. This week's segment of Pirkei Avot, Ethics of Our Fathers, comes from chapter 5, verse 16. Any love that is dependent on something, when the thing ceases, the love also ceases. But a love that is not dependent on anything never ceases. What is an example of a love that is dependent on something? The love of Amnon for Tamar. And one that is not dependent on anything? The love of David and Jonathan. That's all we have for this week's episode of Simcha, a celebration of life. We'd love to hear from you, so send us a message on Facebook at Spirit Sister Productions. From me, Aaron Halevi, and the Simcha team, we wish you a great week ahead.